There we go. Now we are working. Awesome. Beautiful. Oh. Appreciate you for doing this, Brian. Sure. How was your day? How was your weekend? Uh, it's good. Thanks. Nice and sunny here on the coast of Peru. Coast of Peru. Holy cow. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. what, time, what time is it there then? It's Eastern. It's the same as same as over here in Michigan. Uh, it's 105. Okay. Beautiful. That's crazy. I would think that it would be, oh, I guess it's the same, uh, same sort of latitude and stuff, but I would have figured it'd be something crazy, but do you, um, is your permanent residence over there? Mm -hmm. That's nuts. How long have you been living out there? Like uh, as a about, permanent resident? Uh, 12 or 13 years. That's crazy. Um, cause I watch, I watch almost every video you post and you're, you're always out in Peru, whether it's, whether it's a fresh video or whether it's one that you've taken, um, in the past that you've added it and gone over. Mm -hmm. Um, that's so cool. What, uh, what where i guess i'll start out where did where did you grow up i know you're you're canadian correct well i'm canadian and american i've got both citizenships so i was born in the u.s grew up in canada and okay. then have moved back and forth over the course of time that's cool that's cool um when wh i guess where did you when was your first big sort of adventure when when was your first big travel like what what intrigued you to do this sort of stuff even prior to um prior to going into ancient civilizations and stuff like that was there something that sparked it did you always because you you travel you you travel more than probably anyone anyone i've ever watched or or now met which is mm -hmm. insane well i guess the first time was when i went to england when i was 16 and i went to stonehenge with a friend of mine so that was you know that's like that's one of the classic megalithic sites to go to. There wasn't a fence around it. So you were able to walk right up to the stone, which was kind of really? amazing. Were you able to touch the stone? Yeah, at that time you were. That's amazing. That's cool. Is there, you, you talk a lot about when you go to these ancient sites, uh, megalithic sites, uh, especially of like feeling, feeling the energy of the sites, whether it's whether it's whether it's Stonehenge or whether it's uh, in Peru or Egypt and stuff like that, did you get that sense when you were sixteen back then that 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 these places are something special and there's more to them than what mainstream academia sort of tells us? Um, not really. It's it's the first megalithic site I'd ever actually been to physically, so I was just you know just in awe of seeing something. Because yeah. growing up in Canada, you know, there's nothing like that. So to go and yeah. see see that in person was was quite like quite incredible yeah that's crazy um and so 16 you went to stonehenge what did you did you go to school uh college anywhere uh studying this type of stuff uh well i studied science at the university of victoria in british columbia canada so you know that gave me a good scientific background to look at these these places in a kind you know in an analytic kind of way so that's why yeah. I don't tend to have too many theories about how stuff was done yeah. or, who, or who did it. I just like to show people what this stuff looks like. And, and that's why that's re that's really why I love your channel. That's really why I love your work, um, because you'll go to these sites. You, you're actually there. You're not you're not you're not behind a desk. You're not just sitting there talking about stuff. You're actually at the sites. You're going you're showing these clearly, clearly machined uh machine cuts machine boreholes um you're, you're actually showing them um so that's what's really cool and like when it comes to things like like peru uh machu picchu and stuff like that and all over peru um like those interlocking polygonal masonry stones and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, all over the comments the um guys i mean it's it's fine to hear different theories that's what we want to hear because that's how you get to the bottom of stuff but a lot of people uh, saying that that stuff is geopolymer concrete and um, stuff. What do you think about, I guess, I guess, next question. What do you think about the geopolymer concrete idea for Peru specifically? I, I don't buy it at all because uh, to make geopolymer means you have to grind stone up to the consistency of flour, basically. And that, you know, that would take a hell of a lot of work. Yeah. And then, and then you have to be able to mix in different things as a binding agent. So that, you know, that's a geopolymers is a pretty recent, relatively recent discovery. So um, yeah. I, 
I see no evidence of that, whether it's in Egypt or Peru or Puma Punku yeah. uh, in Bolivia. Yeah. 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 I, 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 tend, I tend to agree on that. Um, I mean, and Peru, I mean, all over these places, all over these megalithic sites from Peru to Egypt, all over the place, um, they all display one of the videos that intrigued me, the, one of your videos that intrigued me the most was your video, your first video you did at Tanis, and then mm -hmm. your second one. And just seeing, because I had never seen that site. And like you say in the video, it hasn't been open for as long, not nearly as long as all the other sites around there. Um, and then I watched another video. Uh, I don't know if you've traveled with him, but Ben from Uncharted X. Oh, sure. I've, um, yeah, I've, I've known Ben for, I think, about 10 years. Yeah, he's he's super awesome. Another great channel. If people haven't watched that, um, there's there's quite a few. Same with um, sort of a newer channel, but uh, Jimmy with Bright Insight. He does he does yeah. a lot of a lot of good videos. Um, he, he's a really good one. But Tana specifically, that that place is super intriguing because I know in your videos and one that I've watched with uh, Ben, he. He, he go he goes to the place and you clearly see like something had just completers or people just simply coming in and destroying it with cannonballs and fear that something I don't, i'm not sure what it was but something completely just like decimated exploded basically as if it was a comet as if it was some some energy energy uh release or uh, expulsion or something like that maybe a solar flare or something like that mm -hmm. and then what was crazy was on some of the sides of these um of these stones which some of them are either granite or even diorite and stuff like that some of the hardest stones on earth which you always talk about they look like they were melted like the stone was actually melted what is what is your what is your your main thought or main line of thinking do you think it was because there's a lot of theories that you talk about as well which i'm starting to believe more um with the pyramids and these structures being sort of like energy energy either harnessers or they they this, their location and the way they're built were used to harness or or use the energy somehow do you think that it was do you think that it was um something like that like a man-made like 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 almost so, so like today we have nuclear reactors and stuff and those go wrong all the time well not all the time but they have gone and it's like do you think it's something like that like a lost technology that something went wrong or do you think it was more of like graham hancock's theory of um a torrid meteor coming down and decimating the whole area because i'm kind of i'm kind of convinced of of almost both mm -hmm. well i i think it was probably possibly part of a comet that struck the area mm -hmm. or uh, Robert Schock's theory of a, of a pulse from the a plasma from the sun. But yeah, right. there's definite, you know, as you saw in the video, there's definite evidence that some of the quartzite has been melted um, mm -hmm. and discolored because quartzite is normally kind of a cream color. And you saw with some of the stone that is like purple or black and, and melted. And then the, it looks like some of the granite things that literally exploded. So, right. uh, you know, different stones react to heat in in different ways. But that's I th I think that's what happened. Also, the fact that almost nothing can grow there means that any <laughs> nutrient that was in the soil is you know was vaporized. That's another thing. Uh, the whole area around that looks like a Martian surface. There's there's not yeah. even little weeds growing up. And if you're if you're in right by the the pyramids and stuff there's at least little tumbleweeds growing up little little plants and stuff but here it's just completely completely annihilated completely sterilized basically so yeah. that's super interesting um and that site there's some stones there some blocks and what look like stones that were turned on lathes those are especially in the in the picture your uh, video picture, your video title picture for I think your most recent Tannis video, you see this foot that is just the size of 
it's it's a decimated part of a foot that was some sort of statue what mm -hmm. how big did the how big were the the stones these megaliths at tanis like is there any sense because they're so blown apart and i know they had to un, they had to un, unbury basically like 20 feet or something like that of of sand and stuff just to get to it is it are these megaliths there are they as big as um i mean other places around egypt around around the plateau and such well there there are remnants of probably 13 obelisks like broken into pieces and yeah. uh, the quarry's a thousand miles to the south and the Nile River is not very close, so transporting that would be incredibly difficult. And then the foot you mentioned, um, supposedly you're only allowed to visit a very small percentage of, um, of that site because it's in a military police base. So there are literally people in black suits that follow you with machine guns under their jackets. And if you stray off from where you know where you're supposed to go, then they you know they tell you to come back. So I've heard that the remnants of two giant statues are up and over a hill, and really? so so the statues would originally be somewhere between sixty and hundred feet tall, and made of one piece of stone. That's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Incredible. Um, another question regarding Egypt, um. The Bent Pyramid. I just watched a video. You've covered it too many times, but I watched a video with Ben at Uncharted X. It was his latest video, and he was there with, I'm sure you know, um, I, I know you know, Yusef Awian. Oh, yeah. Very, very, very smart guy. And, like, he's so important to have out there telling the actual, at least showing the actual, the actual artifacts and and not just, not just being a, a Zahi Hawass, not saying that they were just using copper and bronze tools and, 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 uh, and little, whatever they, whatever they use friction saws and stuff to cut these things. Cause it's clear he was underneath the bent pyramid. I think he was with, uh, he was with, uh, use, it was Yusef and Ben and they were showing the pottery and the, it was like, there's no way that these vases and stuff were, were carved out because some of them were granite, some of them were um, uh, like a crystal material, and some of them were so so thinly spun that you he he shined a light on the outside of one, and the light you could like almost it was almost transparent. And mm -hmm. there's there's lathe marks, um, there's centering marks on the bottom of these, and on the inside, clear that they were done with some sort of machine. A question I have is. Um, if they were if they were done on the lathe, say they were, there's a theory that they were, say they had machines, right? Say they had some sort of tech. Is there is there any sort of uh, lathes or anything that are? Um, sorry to sound un, uneducated on this, but like, is there like a a foot pet? You know how like you use you can use foot pedals for um for like clay making clay vases and stuff like that. Is there some sort of thing like that where it's where you can do a human powered thing? Is there some some not so grandiose um, theory on how they did that stuff. I mean, these things are pretty incredible. Well, the archeologists don't even approach how they were done. You know, again, that's the problem. And they list mm -hmm. them, you know, they're listed in, in the Cairo Museum as being pre-dynastic. So that means they were made before the invention of the potter's wheel, that's what they admit. Okay. And as you said, you see machine marks. It's unlikely that it was actually a, a lathe. It was more like a, a CNC machine, which is a computer controlled cutter, because yeah. of course some of them have the lobes sticking out, you know, the front or the sides. So yeah. if you spun that on a lathe, they would break off. So it's more like some machine went in and was able to simply computer control do all that, do that cutting and all that shaping. Uh, so you know that's very that's technically advanced. Yeah. A hundred percent. Another question that just reminded me, I know there's a few theories, but I wanted to get your take on it. You said lobes, and that reminds me of what you see in Egypt on the casing stones of the Great Pyramid. Um, you see it in Peru and the polygonal masonry and such. Those knobs that come out of these stones um, that, are, that are part of the stone, and they're in areas... Um, 
where it doesn't seem like they would just be used for lifting and it's not on all the stones and it's definitely not even on the biggest of the stones. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've heard one theory that maybe they're, because they're, they, they've obviously lasted incredibly long and through, through whatever cataclysmic uh, events happened and perhaps earthquakes and such, do you think that it's um, sort of like uh, energy release area strategic, strategically placed on certain stones throughout the walls or what's your take on those? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good theory. Um, they were obviously deliberately done that, you know, done on purpose. And the, the idea that they were used for lifting doesn't make sense because they're almost never at the center of gravity. Yeah. Um, so I think they had yeah, something to do with energy movement. Um, you know, some people say that the machine that or device that made them was like an extrusion process. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's that's of course one of the most uh, curious questions that nobody has a, a real proper answer for. Um, right. Yeah, that's one of the great enigmas. That's it's really incredible. It's and they're in they're in plate though they're sometimes they're low, sometimes they're high. Um, some people think that it's they were they were little plate. I mean, they're obviously weathered down, so they may have been larger or more protruding, but maybe maybe some wood was set across them or from one to the other, something like that. But again, they're they're in such a non-uniform order that it wouldn't make sense for it's it's not really a uh like little perches for for you to say put wood to maybe put a canopy over a house or something like that it's kind of like you said it's an enig uh, enigma mm -hmm. um going from that topic uh you do a lot of videos and work on the possible existence of an ancient race of giants whether it's you want to call them the nephilim or any of those names um what got you interested in that just a basic question um i'm not really interested in the giants so much there are a lot of other researchers who do that so <clears throat> I've, I've tended to stay away from the anunnaki and the nephilim kind of stuff because there are a lot of people doing that research but of course right. one of my interests are the elongated skulls that are found right. you know in different parts of the world especially where i'm at right now yeah Definitely. And there's quite a few museums that I've seen you do videos on where they display some of these elongated skulls. And it's it's it it's clearly with the, the cranial deformation, it's clearly not it's not just head binding like you see in some cultures, especially in uh, uh, Africa and stuff, because mm -hmm. there's there's it's the, the lions and stuff. They're, they're, they're natural. So it's it's they were born like this without any deformation post birth. Um, on the just back to the uh, giant topic, I, I agree. It's there's a lot of other people that are doing it, and there's a lot of conspiracy that say giants have been found, whether it's in North America, whether it's the um, Native American burial mounds and stuff, whether those were the sites of quote unquote giants. Um, there's there's a conspiracy, if you want to call it that, that say like the Smithsonian archives and stuff and back in the day especially the 1800s you would find something and you might report it and then someone might show up to your place and be like you want to give you money for it you want to put it in a museum or something and then these things have never been seen again there's an interesting place in new zealand i don't know if you've heard of it or done a video on it um it's called the Kaim, Kaim, kaiminawa wall um and it's they're not sh it's it's been it's kind of cordoned off by the by the local government over there right now but there's it it appears to be sort of like a megalithic wall with um sort of interlocking polygonal masonry type stones as well and there's stories of um sort of red-haired taller beings that lived out there that sort of sort of built this area and apparently bones have been found out there um do you think there's any credence to any of that stuff or do you think this is all kind of just kind of like a bigfoot talk or or something like that no because i think these, sorry I, sorry these big yeah. sites there, uh -huh. some people think that oops sorry um actually i've been to the kaimana wall that was okay. about seven years ago and it's you know if they've done a lot of work on it since i was there they've done a lot more excavating local people yeah. 
and they've shown that it's bigger than what I saw. And then the government comes in and the government closes it off so people aren't allowed to access it anymore. And the same thing with, uh, they found lots of giant skeletons in New Zealand that again, the government have apprehended and you know destroyed or buried or whatever, and, and in North America too. So there is a fair amount of evidence that there were very tall people in different parts of the world, but governments systematically have been covering the subject up because it doesn't fit in with Darwinian evolution. It doesn't fit in with creationism. So that, you know, that, that's one of the most depressing things is that when you try to really dig into these subjects, the information gets destroyed very rapidly. Right, definitely. And I've noticed that too with the, the limited research I've done on, on that subject specifically. I know that New Zealand, um, I'm not sure, I can't remember the native, what the uh, original natives were referred to then, but those natives, similar to other ancient um, cultures that talk of previous cultures before them that gave them the knowledge of stuff and such. But the native, the natives of New Zealand claim that there was another race um, of red haired, taller, if you want to call them giants, that, that they sort of wiped out um, and they lived up in the mountains. And I know there's, there's, there's other stories like that in Peru and such, um, which is just interesting. I guess I don't have a question on that. It's just, it's kind of fascinating. Well, um, the, um, well, the modern day indigenous people are called the Maori. Maori, yes, yes. And they're about, I think, 20% of the population. And uh, the, the people who were there before are called the Maori Ori. And they're, yeah, they're in the oral tradition. They're supposedly were quite a bit taller. They were light skinned. They were... They had red hair and green eyes, and they were, they were systematically wiped out by the Maori people. But then they some of them intermixed with with the Maori as well. So there are children um, alive today that still have that genetic red hair. So right. you know, it is definitely um, part of their pre-European history. You know, definitely. But that's it's also a subject that the New Zealand government is trying to discourage people from studying right which is a shame big it's a really a shame and i've seen those i've seen videos on one of the videos that i watched um can't remember the name of the the creator but they were showing descendants of these people and some of them have the the darker sort of um, maori skin but they'll also have blonde hair and like sort of blue eyes or, or mm -hmm. red hair and which is super interesting um so going to another topic, um, this, the subject of, um, have you, have you, uh, do you have an interest in psychedelics or like uh, any of that stuff? Because one of Graham Hancock's theories too is, and it's kind of being kind of proven that these ancient cultures had, a, had a, an investment, had a, a great fascination in things like peyote or uh, DMT in whatever form whatever form they had at the time. And then there's a theory of those on these megalithic sites uh, in Turkey and um, in quite a few other places around the world, these carvings of these sort of taller beings. Um, some of them have wings. Some of them, if, if, you, if you're in a different part of the world, they might have like a fish head, but, but they're all carrying these and not all of them, uh, not everywhere, but a lot of these places uh, from one, one side of the world to the other, they have the same depiction of these people carrying these these handbag sort of things. They look like almost man purses or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. And there's that that and and a lot of them too. They're, they're carrying the handbag, and then the other hand is holding something, whether it looks like a, a pine cone or something like that. And uh, a lot of the ancient cultures, they say that if you believe them, which mainstream likes to laugh at those those ideas, but if you believe what what the actual ancient cultures say is that these people kind of reseeded them with knowledge uh, after a cataclysm or um, um, some people think genetically as well what do you think about that what do you think about what do you make of these handbags that are seen from one one part of the world to the other which at a time they shouldn't have even ever communicated it would take a lifetime to get from 
one side of the world to the next if you even made it you know what i mean now, it's curious that it does that it you know they are found in different parts of the world i think most of them are found in in sumerian depictions and stuff like that which would be one of the oldest cultures on earth and then the like you say the pine cone or the pineal gland is the other thing that supposedly they're carrying yeah. um, you know that's another great unsolved mystery in regards to psychedelics i've tried peyote and i've done ayahuasca a couple of times and been very beneficial to me uh, yeah not recommended for recreational use, but if you're seriously uh, searching for, for things or, or trying to heal yourself, then I would definitely recommend um, either one done under very strict uh, you know, conditions by traditional people who administer those medicines. Right. And for the ayahuasca, is that, is that how many hours is that? Or is it days? Is it... Um... I'm I think it's interested in the ayahuasca. Yeah, I think it averages about four hours. Okay. And you were with you were with uh, either shamans or just someone to guide you through it and do it the traditional way, or is... yes. Well, okay. the two the two times I've done it were you know were with people who had decades and decades of experience in doing it, yeah. and it it was on a one to one basis. I didn't do it with a big group of people. Okay, so that, yeah. it was a very personal experience, very, very profound experience, very life changing for the for the better kind of experience. Yeah, definitely. And that's a that's what most people, if they do it the right way and they don't have any um, pre existing, like whether they're schizophrenic or something like that, I don't recommend it for people who have that. Um, but I haven't done either of those. I have done I have dabbled in um, mushroom psilocybin. And that was that was extremely eye opening just to what what worlds basically could be, which are just right on the right on the right on the other edge, right on the other side of of our baseline consciousness, which is just it's absolutely fascinating. And so I think these ancient cultures, they do you think they uh, I don't know, I don't want to say got the knowledge. Do you think that they were heavily influenced by these these sort of things? Yeah, I think so. I think they were, you know, used as medicines for curing different, you know, psychological problems or medical problems, but also accessing higher states of consciousness for being able to get access to information that otherwise you wouldn't be able to get hold of. Right, right. That's super, that's super cool. Um, switching from that to sort of a just quicker, more fun topic. Um, in Peru, um, so you've been there for 13 years, you said? Mm -hmm. What is your favorite food in Peru? What's the best Peruvian dish? I think the seafood is, is really good here. Is it? Yeah. That's cool. Do, are, you, uh, are you a married man? Mm -hmm. Awesome. To a Peru Peruvian woman? Yeah. That's awesome. That's cool. Um, that's really fascinating. Do you have any kids? Nope. Got dogs. Dogs? Heck yeah. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. What kind of dogs do you have? A uh, bull terrier and a pit bull. That's cool. That's cool. Do you, uh, what is it, what is there to do? Are you in, um, what part of Peru are you in? Are you in Cusco? Or are you in, do you mind me asking? Oh, I'm on the coast about three hours south of Lima, which is the capital. Okay. So I'm in a small town across the street from the ocean. So very, very nice climate. That's um, cool. Uh, access to great local food. That's awesome. Is there, uh, are there any uh, uh, megalithic sites there? Are there any uh, polygonal masonry, anything like that in your area? Uh, a little bit. That's mainly in the highlands, but of course I'm pretty close to the Nazca area. So that's where, you know, okay. the Nazca lines are. Those Nazca lines are insane. And it's, it's, it's incredible. Sorry to jump again, but it's incredible that the area of those Nazca lines and then that, that plateau, which looks like it was just laser cut and almost looks like a runway and it looks like the top of a mountain was just completely sheared off and i know that the um the giza plateau also has it's it's curious because that looks like it was sort of the same way it looks like it was completely flattened because the area immediately around immediately around giza it doesn't seem to be as perfectly flat it's it's like like it was leveled for that reason do you 
do you do you think about that stuff? Do you agree or? No, I think it's the ocean that was uplifted over over the course of time, both okay. in both in Nazca and also Giza. So there's you know millions of years of slow tectonic movement causing the the um, both areas to rise up out of the water because Giza is all limestone, and uh, it's uh, in Nazca you can you know you can find lots of um, lots of fossils and things like that showing that it was the ocean floor at one time. That's cool. That's super cool. Um, what, what is, um, what's, what do you, what do you make of jumping one more, one more topic here? Uh, what do you make of these UFO UAPs that have been released by the government? Um, tons of it. These, these UFO sightings and encounters, if you want to call them that, whatever, they go back further than the 40s and stuff further than the most famous cases they're kind of been they're kind of a, they're kind of a biblical topic almost they're kind of ingrained in almost all these ancient cultures um what do you make of the 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 new videos released i guess by the government uh specifically like the tic tac ufo or the go fast video from commander fravor if you're familiar with him what do you make of that stuff well i think it's good that this stuff is is slowly being released it's about time you know, because this everything's been so under, you know, undercover for decades, if not hundreds of years. So I'm I'm happy to see that the government is actually finally starting to release relatively recent information that the military itself admit, you know, they can't explain how these things can move so incredibly quickly from, you know, from just above the ocean straight up into the, you know, into the sky and back and forth and stuff like that. So it's a good beginning. And uh, yeah. of, of course, more and more people are looking at these subjects, more and more people have, ca you know, have phones that have good quality cameras on them. So there's so much that's being recorded. So many sightings in Mexico City, as, like in Mexico, especially that uh, the government there is much more open to, uh, you know, not trying to cover this stuff up. So I think the US is very much behind other countries. Russia has been doing this kind of stuff for decades of, you know, ex, ex, uh, you know, exploring this stuff. So it's it's about time that this stuff started to be uh, recognized as being real and, you know, admitting that they have no that they didn't make it. They have no idea who did. No country on the planet has technology like that. So it's a good beginning. Right, and there's and, and these things it, from the people talking about them, um, they say that they'll come from. I mean, there's a one case Commander Favor talks about. These one of them comes from eighty thousand feet to about fifty feet in like half a second, and then hovers or whatever, or the the where he flies around it, and it um, he's about like a hundred miles away from the USS Nimitz, which is the aircraft carrier that he flew out on, and he's watching this thing, and then in the blink of an eye, just boom gone and then says that it shows up on radar by by their aircraft carrier within like half a second which is which is just incredible and they mm -hmm. talk about them going from from space space levels uh out of, out of the atmosphere levels to to just in the air like our planes and helicopters and such to actually under the water um so whatever these things are whether they're whether they're technological or if, if there's some undiscovered maybe biological or biological would be harder but something something maybe other other dimensionally something crazy like that it's it's super fascinating have you um have you yourself ever seen any sort of unexplainable ufo lights or anything yeah quite a few really especially, especially in this in this area this is yeah. one of the major places where people see unidentified objects so, right. What was the what was the most what was the most uh, startling or or intriguing one that you saw? Can you explain that just a little bit? Uh, yeah. About twenty years ago, on the island of Maui, I saw uh, a metallic object that was about two hundred feet long, kind of a cigar shape. I saw it for about ten minutes, and wow. uh, it's nothing. You know, it's nothing that I could identify from you know, from my living history as to what it was. It wasn't a plane, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. Right. Um, and then I've also seen a number of orb-like things 
<clears throat> here on the coast of Peru that have shown up. It was mainly about three years ago that I saw those, quite a few in the space of a few months. Okay. And the main feeling I always get is these things show up because they want you to see them. Right. That's crazy. And there's there's people like, whether you agree or don't agree with him, uh, but Dr. Stephen Greer, who who can kind of kind of almost call these things in just by um, he'll do it in, in large groups and they'll go out into the desert. I think he does it mostly in Arizona, but they'll all kind of basically meditate and kind of call in these things, whatever they are. And sometimes they'll show up and it's kind of it's the, the videos that they have too are kind of kind of unexplainable because these these lights will show up and they'll, they'll go they'll come into view and then just disappear and then go from one place to the next or move really quick mm -hmm. um, that that sort of stuff is super interesting um a lot of people whether it's uh, a coordinated sort of discrediting but a lot of people discredit that sort of stuff but i think it's super interesting and worth looking at mm -hmm. um sort of another fun topic have you do you believe in anything paranormal or anything like that ghosts quote unquote yeah I've, I've had a lot of encounters and stuff like that really in peru or younger days or yeah when i was a kid okay yeah can you explain them any of those or well i've seen ghosts you know suddenly waking up in the middle of the night and then seeing like a translucent person walking towards me and then disappearing yeah and i, I had one poltergeist experience once in in a house that was quite quite bizarre but yeah. that that was more of when i was quite a bit younger okay i'm i'm the same um i haven't seen anything recently i've i've moved from a different house but i grew up in a in an old farmhouse in michigan upper peninsula um and it was built it was built there was there was a homestead on the property so a really old place it was built early 18 uh same with the sauna the barn um some outbuildings and stuff like that and then the the other part of the house was was built in the 1930s or 40s i believe and we renovated it my parents renovated it we had an add-on to the house um but they renovated it top to bottom and we had a long attic room in the top of the top of the house and um first night in that room it was a cool room first night in that room that i stayed in there i had could have just been from moving rooms or something like that but first night sleeping in that that part of the house um i was asleep and i don't know if it was a uh if it was whatever they call um like lucid dreaming or something like that but i woke up and it felt like to the right of my my body but enveloping my whole being like to the core it was just someone yelling just Bruh! just like like an angry sort of demonic yell just to the core of my body and then kind of couldn't move and then woke up a few minutes later kind of like sweating like panic attack I'm not sure if it was a dream or whatever so that one was weird and then one more experience I had was same room opposite side and I had my dog I had a, a dog at that time yellow lab golden retriever just like the nicest dog that you could ever ever imagine wouldn't bark he would cool with kids uh just not a mean bone in his body. He would only bark if someone was like in the driveway, immediate driveway. And we had a long, we had like a sort of a long dirt driveway, like classic farm driveway. And I had navy blue blacked out sort of curtains. And um, I woke up one night and my dog on his hind legs, you know how they say dogs and like babies and stuff can sometimes sense these things, but my dog, foot of my bed woke up to my dog on his hind legs claws fully like um fully out gripping the bed he's shaking on his back legs and he's just vroom, vroom, just barking at basically the wall at nothing and had a really weird feeling when i woke up i'm looking at the same same area just felt super didn't see anything but felt super like like something was there and then i had to like comfort my dog um that stuff is super interesting to me as well um whether you believe in it or not, but that stuff is very cool. Hmm. Yeah, that, that stuff is, and my brother, he had his experience as well, but just that sort of stuff too. It's kind of along the lines of, of all this, all this stuff of, it's sort of all intertwined with like 
these other dimension dimensional beings whether some people think that the ufos and uaps and stuff are sort of like demonic or biblical type creatures you know what i mean um so that's just that's just another line of thinking on that um um uh, i guess i guess we can wrap this up um one more question if if you could give your 22 year old self or 22 year old anyone um some advice life advice any sort of advice what would you give them start traveling start traveling mm -hmm. you learn a lot from traveling hey well you learn a lot yeah you learn a lot more when you visit these places in person mm -hmm. so that's that's what i recommend people that's the thing it's like these videos are incredible i watch them on my tv and stuff and they're incredible on that but i can't imagine actually being there i've traveled to a few places nothing nothing as far out as egypt or peru i'd like to someday and hopefully hopefully with 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 you and your company hidden inca tours um which people should really check out you do you go all over the place you go egypt peru uh believe you're all you're in bolivia which is which is south america um where's uh where's where do you recommend uh someone go on their first trip say if they're going with you would you recommend going to Egypt if they're if they're interested in all of those places? Would you recommend Egypt first? Is there somewhere you'd recommend first, or is just kind of any one of them? Yeah, I'd recommend probably Egypt to start with, and then Peru afterwards because they're the two okay. most obvious places. Right. And then over the course of time, you know, Petra and Jordan, and Baalbek and Lebanon, and Easter Island, lots of different or Turkey, lots of different places to go. Turkey. I'd, I'd love to go to Turkey for sure. Um, go back to Tepe. That's a place that I want to see a lot. Is um, sorry. One more question: Is Mount Mount Nemru is in Turkey, correct? Yeah. And that's those have those giant um, those giant head statues. And what what is what's the theory of that? There's supposedly something under that, or it looks like just a big pile of rubble. It's kind of a kind of a really weird sight. And then there's these massive statues um do you know anything about that yeah it's called a tell so it's actually an artificial mountain that was built okay. and so there are probably lots of tombs underneath it and then the, yeah then the statues built on top of it interesting that's super cool well, uh, rap future um this was super this was an experience this was a really cool experience for me especially um meeting you and getting to talk just a little bit about some of this stuff there's so many topics we haven't covered and um kind of just scratching the surface of this stuff but this is this is a great great introduction to meeting one of my heroes and getting to talk to you so i really appreciate this great did you get a chance to record it I did get a, re it's recording right now. Um, yeah, it says it's recording. Do you mind if I, if I upload this and I could send it to you as well? Yeah, please do. Of course. Yeah, for sure. This is great. Um, if, if people are watching, um, definitely go to Brian Forrester's channel on YouTube. I've showed so many friends and family, your YouTube channel, and they're always immediately intrigued. Um, they're your Instagram, especially if, if they don't have time to watch a video, and they're just sitting and wanting to look at something you have so many pictures of megalithic sites that'll just completely open your mind to what these things could be and just different different lines of thought of what they could be because you look at these things and then you you try and tell yourself that they were built with bronze aged copper tools and stuff like that and dudes in loincloths and stuff and it's 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 clear that it's not that so definitely mm -hmm. check out check out all of brian's channels um post videos regularly and they are always always great so appreciate you brian thank you very much my pleasure thank you thank you talk soon okay thanks